Okay, well, let's go ahead and officially call the meeting to order. And Janelle, if you're there, um, we, we hope you are. So say something if you are. <laughs> uh, welcome to our regular scheduled uh, school board meeting here tonight. Thanks for, for being here virtually with us. Um, first order up, you know, we weren't so good at the Pledge of Allegiance while we were virtual previously, but I'd like to, to keep the Pledge of Allegiance going here. So we'll just kind of recite along. Um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Well, on our early items here tonight, uh, first item is the Military Science Club Opportunity Presentation. So I'm sorry, I don't have a specific name here, but Mr. Marshall, maybe you could direct me to the right person to introduce. So this is Nancy. Um, I just made Officer Wattenberger a co-host in case they oh, have a presentation okay. and um, Janelle Howard just joined us. Okay, great. Good to see you. Good to have you here, Janelle. And Officer Wattenberger, are you with us? Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so my name is Mercedes. I'm a specialist in the Oregon Army National Guard. And then uh, my partner here is Sergeant Eric Andreessen. And we are going to present to you guys. Let me see if I can do this from my phone. Only one host can share. Okay. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe we can share. Maybe we can't. Okay. Um, let me see if I can bring it up here. I don't think it's gonna let me yeah, it? saying well it's saying that only one host can share in the meeting so I don't know if we're, if we're going to be able to but we do have access to your presentation that we can pull up I mean yeah. um just to let you know it's like oh. if you have the sl slides um yeah the board packet has your your presentation in it so we yeah, can kind of call out parts there and we can kind of follow along at home as it were okay yeah so um, actually, I made a different um, PowerPoint for just the Military Science Club, um, but, but we can do it this way as well. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to grab the packet you guys have so we have something, we can see the same things. Uh, so Sergeant Andreessen runs a Military Science Club class at South Medford High School, and uh, they actually use that as a credited class under one of the teachers there. Um, and we're hoping to launch this in January when you guys start up back up again and as a club rather than a class to kind of do a soft sell version of it uh, to see what the interest is like with the kids at Brookings Harbor High School. And that way we can just give them something that they can be involved with. Um, I can do meetings either virtually or in person, um, depending on what the guidelines are. Uh, my plan is to meet with students two times a week for about an hour after school. The modules are set up to where uh, for the month we learn something. And then at the end of the month, the last meeting of the month, we do kind of a more hands-on application of what was learned for that module. Uh, some of the things that we would be teaching the kids are um, drill and ceremony, customs and courtesies, kind of like a junior ROTC. You can uh, imagine what that's like. I have access to like night vision goggles that I can bring in and actually let the kids have hands-on experience with. Uh, land navigation. Uh, I would really like to tie the, the club to historical uh, things that have happened in the area, such as the Mount Emily bomb site. So taking the kids out there and, and letting them see that and learning about that history from the area. Um, and really just teaching goal setting that the army uses and um, like mental resilience, especially during these times when kids are, you know, stuck on computer screens, they don't have access to a lot of their friends and family like they used to. And I think a lot of kids are struggling. So I think that would be a really good topic as well in the club to just kind of focus on and really kind of, you know, helping the members of the club gain leadership skills and working together as a team and kind of making plans for their future after high school. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, what, is there kind of a start date on this? You have to kind of fill me in a little bit. Is there a, um, a plan to kind of Move, yes, the plan forward. would be to the plan would be to start it uh, when they come back from winter break the next the okay. next term. 
So I think that's January 22nd. Yeah, second semester is second is, semester. Yeah, so so okay. we'd be starting it when they'd come back. Um, and then I would open the club to all grades. Uh, juniors and seniors would probably have a better grasp on the material. That's what we've seen in our class setup. Um, but just to get, it's more fun when there's more kids and I wouldn't want to, as a club, distinguish between the grades. So I would open it up to all of the grade levels, um, focusing on juniors and seniors, just because they're about to graduate and start planning on things after high school and they'll have a better grasp of the material as far as what we cover um, mental resilience wise and planning all that stuff. Freshmen and sophomores tend to not quite be there yet, um, but they're, they're definitely welcome to join. Wow, interesting. Uh, Janice, so did I had you... It. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it looks like Janice did, put a question up yeah, on the Janice chat had there. A, yeah. She did. She wanted to know if we'd had an ROTC. And we, I, I'm pretty sure we did, but I don't remember how long ago we had that. It's probably been a while. Um, um, one, so, one of the biggest differences about the uh, ROTC is that uh, the program that, I'm sorry, this is Staff Sergeant Andreessen, Eric Andreessen, and I actually am from Brookings originally. Um, the program that, that we're presenting today uh, is of no cost to Brookings Harbor. So, you know, an okay. ROTC program or a JRTC program, mm -hmm. uh, you have to pay the instructors and there's a lot of other you know, red tape that comes along with that. And this is a way to kind of get around that and, and bring something additional to students that they wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to, to do. Um, a lot of the kids that, that take my class personally, in fact, the majority of them do not enlist into any branch. Um, some leave that class with a, an education on, on which branch would be best for them. Um, and some just appreciate the opportunity to play with a Humvee, experience night vision goggles, have a different kind of group and a team within the school that they now can function with. Um, and we've seen some amazing results, whether they enlist or not. Sounds exciting. I have a quick, is, yeah, is, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I just had a quick question. I'm looking at the, um, you know, the course overview, the syllabus that was provided for us. So I noticed the required text is uh, the Army Blue Book. Um, I'm assuming that you're going to be covering all the uh, branches of the military or going over the basics of each of them, because I'm assuming Correct. some so, students may be interested in others. Yes. And the, when we get into specific things like, um, you know, like the night vision goggles, we'll speak directly about how we utilize them. But there is okay. a portion in the class itself that is going to cover each branch. Um, the strengths and the weaknesses of, of what maybe the, the students' personal goals are and how um, that branch might be able to fulfill them. Um, and then is, again, the, the biggest thing for me is if a student is leaning towards a military branch, as long as they're educated and they're making a healthy decision, uh, a lot of times the students will fill out an application that I give them. And then they take that down to that recruiter or they'll ask me like, hey, which is the recruiter you prefer at that station? And so we'll set them up on the best path. <clears throat> yeah, they also then have somebody that they can go ask those questions to that recruiter and, and then come back and say, hey, is this accurate? And, you know, I had one student that was uh, determined to join the active duty military and was about to drop out of school halfway through his senior year um, because he got misinformation that he could enlist with active duty with a GED. So I went and found the regulation form where it stated that, yes, you can, but you have to have a 50 on the ASVAB and they're typically limited to the inner city because there's very few actually awarded. So that student changed his path and actually graduated high school so that he could go active duty and not risk that. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great, great alternative, sounds like for some, some students then, that's just wonderful. Well, I was very excited when I read it. <laughs> and uh, I didn't, you know, I went to high school there and we didn't have it then and my kids went and I, they didn't have it then. So I was, I was very, very happy to see it being offered. Thank you very much. I appreciate the support. Thank you. And so, Alan, just uh, for, for clarification, I think uh, Specialist Wattenberger pointed out is that what, what the high school is considering now would be to start the club second semester. And then, you know, obviously, if that goes well, the intent would be to consider beginning the class next fall. Okay. Okay. That's great. And, like and that's quick, quick, as a class, what, um, what area does it fall under? So at South Medford High School, it's considered an elective. 
Um, my okay. classroom is is basically you're typically out with like the other CTE type classes. Um, but I tell you, it, the the plethora of students that I get, I get everything from the theater kid who who's just <laughs> curious on what it's going to look like to the athletes. Uh, and it's pretty impressive to watch them come together uh, through the course of the teamwork stuff that we do. Um, we get we get a very wide variety at South Medford High School. They do the uh, pathways. So typically there's a there's a pathway because it's a much larger school for mm -hmm. like art and theater. And they, those kids tend to hang out together because all of those classes are in one hallway. Uh, and then you have, you know, the medical people and, and all those types of students in another hallway. But my class is usually kind of the nucleus that kind of brings a little bit from everybody. So it's, it's, it's cool. an interesting operation. Yeah. I, I think it's a I think it's a great idea to offer this to students who are interested. So Absolutely. I'm in support of it. Yeah, likewise. So thank you for that. That's that's a great information. We look forward to hearing how it's going uh, next semester for the club and we hopefully we can get an update maybe in a couple months. And see where we're at. So thank you both for being here tonight. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, our student representative report, Nahomi. If I, if I, sorry if I mispronounced your name there, but um, wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of an update. Yeah. Could you okay. So... Recently, we had some people helping at the Elks Lodge for their food drive, which seems to be going pretty well. But we did have to ca cancel the food drive for the K schools ever since they had to go strictly online. And that happened after Thanksgiving. And we also received some donations from people, including the Lutheran Church, to shop for families for the holidays. And this year, we have seven families and helped out 16 kids. And we began wrapping presents last Wednesday, and we're going to continue tomorrow, Thursday. The junior class also attended the high school last Wednesday for limited in-person learning for some emotional learning, and as well as the seniors for the college literature and comp composition class. And in-person learning went really well. We had some really great discussions that we haven't had in a while. And the teacher seemed really excited to finally see some students at the school. Yeah, you know, I saw a few pictures about that. It looked like some some badminton or something going on. So that was that was neat to see. I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, where are you wrapping gifts at? We're doing that in Mrs. Cleesby's room. Oh, at the at school. school. Okay. Yeah. So you're not yeah. doing it for public. No. Okay, I thought it was a fundraiser and I was going to bring some gifts down. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can accept donations. <laughs> Darn. No, I didn't, I didn't want to donate the gift. I wanted you to wrap them for me. Oh, the wrapping, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, well, thank you for that. Uh, good to see there's some activity in the building and continue to try to stay connected, Mr. So Thank you. All right. Well, flowing right along here, uh, the Kamiopsis Elementary School presentations. I saw Principal Sharon Yon on the call, so I will yep, I'm I right. turn it to you. Hello. Hello. So I, let's see, I don't think that Car Carol, the plan was for Carol to present the slideshow. However, I just shared it with Nancy and Dee Dee, so hopefully one of them can share it. Because we aren't allowed to do that. You, Carol's host now. I uh, oh, Carol's host now? Okay, so Carol can Okay, share. so I can share my screen. I be careful, find... we've given you the power, I guess. Uh, yeah, and I gotta find the right file. That would be scary, <laughs> huh? So, um, we like to record the I like your Christmas trees behind you. That's great. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I've got mine right there, too. Okay, access, da 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 da, da. Oh my gosh. Okay, this might take longer than what you think. have it here just isn't gonna let me do it okay let me see if I oh there it goes allow zoom so we'll be able to record contents of the screen later all right let's see if it lets me share it there you go there it goes seeing something I think there I we it. go it I think worked. I did it yep you did okay okay nice job it's all the Google Meet stuff. I got that down. This is Zoom. Zoom's different, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't use Zoom regularly. We sit in Google Meets pretty much all day long these days. So, 
Um, Carol, you can go ahead and get us on the first slide. So, Oops, sorry, that's like touchy. Okay, got it. There we go. So um, under our first area to talk about is student success. And right now we really feel like student success is uh, extremely, it's tied to attendance. Um, so you have in front of you our attendance numbers from the first day of school, September 11th, until December 9th, um, when I pulled this data. And the very first section is perfect attendance, which is a huge celebration. 25% of our kids have not missed any school. Um, that's unheard of. Doesn't happen like that in a, during a regular time of school. Um, part of the reason is that how we look at attendance is a little bit different in the online world and in the CDL wor world. In face-to-face, -face, if you're here, you're here. Um, even though we did have some kids during our face-to-face -face time that ended up um, joining their classrooms virtually during the three hours um, because they had a reason they could not be at school. For instance, they were quarantining, uh, but feeling fine. And then we set it up so that those kids could be virtually with their classmates and their teacher and still be able to attend. Um, so there are some different modes of attendance that is helping some kids have better attendance. Yeah, uh, flexibility of it. The flexibility is there. So 146 students with perfect attendance is huge. Um, by the end of the school year, in a regular school year, we have maybe 20, 25 kids who have perfect attendance. Wow. And so we're halfway through and there's a lot of them. So we're really going to have to think about how we're going to celebrate that at some point because it yeah. deserves celebration. Um, we have 417 kiddos that are regular attenders. So that means during that time frame, they've had five or less days absent. And that includes the 146 who had perfect attendance. So there's that. Um, and then we have the two groups that we worry about. Um, we have 106 kiddos that are chronically absent. So that means they've been gone from either between six, seven or eight days in that time frame. And then we have 67 students, which is 11% was more than eight days absent. Um, the biggest difference and the reason that group is so big is that um, we do not drop kids anymore. Um, in a normal school year, after 10 days of non-attendance, we would drop that student from our role. We're not allowed to keep them on anymore. If they return, then we put them back on. Uh, now we need to leave them on until we get a request for records from somewhere or a homeschool registration. Um, and we have some challenges connecting with some families and some kids. And um, we call every day, um, try to make contact. Um, Officer Johnson went out on a search and rescue mission today to try to find three of our kiddos from the same family. Um, and I've gone out several times to homes. <laughs> and Carol went on some, goes on some interesting trips. To, and with the family today, we don't, we're not even really quite sure where they live. And so there's definitely some challenges that make it difficult um, in the attendance area. But I think some of the flexibility really does work for some families. And so it's something we need to think about as a district moving forward, how we're gonna allow some of that flexibility to continue when we return to normal. So just pieces. Um, staff recruitment and retention. Our, our biggest problem right now is a substitute shortage. Um, it is not a Brookings Harbor School District problem. It's a problem every single district in the country has. Um, whether you're in Chicago, Los Angeles, or Atascadero, California, where our friend Krista Connolly currently is, there are no substitutes. Um, in our building, we have solved the problem by having people that work in the building who can sub. Carol can sub, I can sub. Amy Saylor, SEL specialist subs, um, Kyla Siri, our reading specialist subs, 
and Charlene Worthy is one of our IAs who has a substitute a teaching license. And so we have a rotation going and we take turns. Um, Carol's done a lot this fall in classrooms. Um, and Elena, the other okay. piece, yes, Catherine. Um, just a quick question with, I, mean, I just asked this because we have a friend that comes to this area who is interested in subbing. Um, do they need to have a recent negative COVID test? I mean, what are the requirements for subbing these days? They just have, they need to be an employee with ESS, which is okay. the company that we contract to sub with subs for. And then they have to have an Oregon substitute license and it's pretty straightforward. And you can get a Oregon substitute license as long as you have a bachelor's degree in okay. something. Perfect, okay, thanks. So we would appreciate anybody who's willing to lend a hand. So yeah, I will let him know. Okay. Helen, um, Helen, is that including uh, school board members? <laughs> <laughs> if you have a bachelor's degree, and you want to sub. I think that would be just fine. <laughs> we will let you. We will let you. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, you, you, a, a school board member can't be an employee of the school, and so yeah, but they're not employees I don't of the true. school. Mm. Oh, your employee of ESL. I didn't think about that. Oh, okay. Huh. It, it, it's just, uh, I think that it's actually right now with the way classrooms are structured, um, it's kind of fun because it's a really small group of kids and they're really attentive and it's, I think, much more pleasant than it used to be, it used to be right. right now. And you also, it, it, the cool part about it is you get on there with all these different classes because I've subbed in several of them. And it's it's so different and you really get to see what the teachers are dealing with and the parents are dealing with every single day. And that is a benefit for us because we're like, okay, I feel you, I get it. I get the kids swiveling on the chair and going on the floor and doing all this weird stuff in the camera. It's, it's interesting, but they managed to get it done. So it's good. And it was very good. I was the teacher for online third grade one day, and it was good for me to to do those technical pieces that I don't do on a regular basis and use all the tools. And I was pretty proud of myself that it worked. <laughs> so, and it was fun to see the kids, um, obviously. So there's that. Um, one good thing about recruitment and retention, because I promised David I would put something positive in there. Um, our two newest hires that we did in right before school started, and I don't think I'm allowed to mention names in, in the public forum like this, but they are fantastic. They're wonderful. One was an IA, an employee of ours, and the other person um, applied for a job, recent Santa Cruz, University of Santa Cruz uh, graduate. They're fantastic. They're doing great. And so we're very happy with that. All right, Carol, you can click next. Um, something we're working on with relationships with kids, um, we've started um, doing the DESA, which is the Devereaux <clears throat> assessment that looks at students' strengths. And so teachers are trained and then they give, um, they take an assessment for each one of their kids to see where they're at. So our fourth and fifth grade teachers completed those assessments and here's our summary. So this shows what our fourth and fifth graders, where they're at. We have about a quarter of the kiddos that have high needs where we need to provide some social and emotional supports. They don't handle conflict or difficult things easily. They need some skills training. And so that's our orange slice. Um, the big navy blue slice is our kids with typical fourth, fifth grade skills. And so we can support them with just general pieces. They've got their um, most of those skills. And then our light blue um, group are kids that have some really strong skills in this area that can probably help our kids that are in the orange. And so the assessment actually gives us not only the areas where the kids are struggling, but then will also give us lessons and interventions to do with the kiddos and we're quite excited. So when PLC time starts for K3 in January, um, they will go next. And so 
And I did several of the um, goal conferences with staff today, going over the DESA scores. And we were looking at kids that may move on to the next level to where we need to give them that longer test to see what exactly they're looking at, what skills they're lacking. And so then we use those lessons with Amy, who's our SEL person, and she integrates that with the classroom. And then she has separate sessions with those kids working on some of those skills. So it was pretty cool. Okay, next. Last, we have sort of a very exciting piece. Um, Rory Smith reached out um, from the Gimney Foundation and kind of wondered, you know, was there something we would, would want for our kids? Um, thinking about sort of fun, active things to do. As we all know, Rory's into athletics and, you know, that starts on the playground, right? So um, he had us kind of come up with a wish list um, and we were thinking he would fund one of those things. Um, he decided to fund them all. And so if Carol flips to the next slide, um, here's a list of things that uh, Rory already gave us some money for. Um, we're gonna buy some Chromebooks to replace some of the dam damaged units that we're getting and will get. Um, we have some family who simply can't pay the $200 and we're feeling like um, this will be a really good way to replace those without placing additional stress on families right now. Um, the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna develop a fifth grade basketball court area um, between the fifth grade building and the, where RTI is located. And so we're gonna get some nice basketball hoops and have them installed right there. And then we have um, a, um, between the transportation, the kindergarten modulars, there's a grassy area. And we really don't have a whole lot of a kinder appropriate play equipment. And we also have a new group of kiddos that um, are living over in the kinder area from early intervention that are three to five year olds. And so we're going to, going to get some a little tiny play structure and a little dome to climb on to put out there so the kids have some place to go play. And then by popular request from kiddos and adults, we're gonna put some swings back on the main playground as long as we can get our insurance company to sign off on it because that's why we took them down in the first place. So questions. Yeah, it's great news, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that donation here a little bit later in the, the show. But um, no, certainly appreciate Give Me Foundation and Rory for continuing to support uh, like they do. That's, that's yep, great. absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Okay, can I stop sharing? Yes. Thank you. Ever. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. I did have one question, uh, Lena. That assessment yeah. is that is that a written assessment, or how do those kind of those? Um... It's a, a it's a electronic, but each teacher spends a couple minutes on each kid and answers eight specific questions about each child, and then if they go to the next level, so say they score in the orange, then there's a little bit longer assessment that it's all done by the teacher. And so it does require that the teacher knows the kids pretty well. When you do it in the upper grades, like by high school, then it's an assessment the kid takes on their own. Oh, interesting. I just was curious how, how this kind of determinations are made, I guess. Yeah, well, and it's interesting because Carol and I were looking at the data that we have and different people's perspectives certainly um, is, is, is visible in that data a little bit. And yeah. what's cool, what's nice about the data, though, is you have that conversation with that person and say, okay, what do you see? What is it that we need to address? And that's kind of the conversations we had today and will continue to have over the next, when we come back for the K-3, is what are you seeing there and what do you see as their strengths? And then do you have the pieces in place for the SEL piece of it? Or do we need to get you additional help and get that next level of testing? So that gives us a lot of room to, to help and support them, plus allow them to choose strategies that they already have in their, their basket and, and help the kids. So and we, we have a lot of kids, but we set goals today. So the kids in the red, how many of those kiddos do you think we're gonna get to the next level based on the interventions we're gonna do? And so it was really good. It's, it's kind of like our RTI intervention pieces. How many kids do we have in the red that we can move up? 
and that's kind of how we see it. So Work on a pathway to improve them. Mm -hmm. Well, because I think if kids can't, if kids can't deal with adversity and difficult things, life becomes really difficult because if you're truly learning academic material, you're going to struggle and you're going to need to be able to deal with that. It's hard. And, and I think we have some kids who really need some support in that. So hoping that we can provide that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any questions for our team here while we've got them? All right. Well, thank you very much. Very, very oh, nice. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have citizen input. Um, Nancy, I'm kind of looking at the chat screen here. Do we have anybody that's looking to, to go here? Hello. I'm not seeing anyone. This is Nancy Raskowski Coons, Public Information Officer. Um, I know we had a request over email from our frequent commenter, Gordon Clay. So Gordon, if you are somewhere in the meeting, um, either use the raise hand function or uh, ask to unmute yourself. And anyone else who would like to make a public comment um, uh, after uh, Board Chair Allen reads the policy on that, um, please just make a comment or raise your hand. This is the time for that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read the policy real quick. We'll see if anybody raises their hand the next moment or two. So our board meeting public comment statement. So as a board, we welcome and encourage input from the public. Speakers will be given three to five minutes at the discretion of the board chair for their comments. If several members of the public wish to speak on the same topic, we encourage you to appoint a spokesperson to speak to the entire group. Speakers may offer objective criticism of district operations and programs, but the board will not hear public complaints concerning current or past district personnel. Understanding it can be uncomfortable for all involved. If your comments appear to be heading in this direction, I'll ask you to stop and invite to speak with me after the meeting in order to assist in resolving your concerns. So with that being read aloud, do we have anyone chomping at the bit for a comment here? Okay. I guess I don't see any on the screen there unless I'm missing it, uh, Nancy. Uh, or I do not have any requests that have come in. Um, if I get one in the next minute or two, I'll let you know, but otherwise I'm seeing none. Okay. So. Well, we can revisit if, if Mr. Clay shows up, but let's kind of soldier on here. Uh, item number five is our consent agenda. And I would uh, look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. I will second that motion. <clears throat> um, how many discussion or questions on the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and uh, vote on the motion on the table to approve it. Um, Catherine. Aye. Denise. Aye. Janelle. Aye. Uh, Jay? Aye. And I for me as well. All right. Item number six, district reports and information. Mr. Marshall, you are up for some comments here. All right. Thank you. You're, you're um, on. I'm looking forward to the Military Science Club. I will definitely plan on being there when they do the ninth vision conference. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like Let fun. me know when the Hummer comes to town. On yeah, exactly. Sure. All right. My husband wanted to go to the geocaching. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, um, and as uh, our student rep, uh, Nohemi, mentioned about, um, you know, students who haven't yet been on campus, been able to be on campus. Uh, and that's, that's part of our goal to expand uh, limited in-person instruction, which we're, we call LIPI. Of course, you need an acronym for everything. Um, and, and so we have been doing that over the last couple of weeks uh, at, at all levels, elementary, middle school and high school. Um, and that is the plan. Should we should the metrics require us to be um, in CDL after the uh, winter holidays um, would be to look at opportunities to continue expand to bring the kids in for different activities. 
Um, you know, common ones of high school, they've been coming in and I think some of you have seen the pictures, you know, working in their different shop projects, but it, it's pretty open-ended under Ready School Safe Learners, what we can bring them in for. Um, and so um, the only caveat is, is that under limited in person, a, a school class or teacher cannot require it. Um, and so it's, it's not counted as like regular class instruction. Um, but as you know, as we heard, um, you know, it, it can be a really well received opportunity, both from the teacher and uh, as well as the students. So, um, so that would be our plan to continue to look for opportunities within the schedule and even modifying the schedule um, to expand those uh, being able to bring kids in for those specific purposes. Um, should we need to continue with CBL after, after break. Um, and just an, another part of that is um, the middle school this afternoon, um, they had a, a virtual holiday party. Um, and I, I wasn't able to jump in, but I heard a fair amount about it in terms of they had like a room, little different Google breakout rooms with some with like music going on. So the kids were actually dancing in their house. Um, as well as different game rooms and that sort of thing as sort of their, um, you know, end, end of December wrap up holiday party. Plus they also did, and I believe uh, the elementary school did, um, like a, a book and little gift bag pickup. Um, and then for the kids who weren't able to come in over the last few days and pick them up with their families, they're actually, I know the administrators are talking about um, doing some delivery on that as well, um, just as, you know, a little sort of holiday um, celebrations and just having some fun in some in creative ways. So, um, and, and again, we will look to continue that if there is the need to continue with CDL after break. Um, and one other thing that's uh, percolating, and so the governor just called, uh, I think, what is it, the fourth special session? Um, I don't know the dates, but one of the big topics, and it especially relates to us, um, that there's a draft bill out there for essentially a COVID liability waiver. So that's gonna be huge um, for, you know, essentially for public uh, government offices as well as schools. Um, and as I understand it, essentially is if, if you're following the Ready Schools Safe Learners guidelines, we will then have uh, limited liability protection from, uh, you know, if somebody does uh, contract COVID while, while on site. So um, so that, that will be, um, and, and it's, being communicated as part of the overall effort to support um, being able to get kids back in class consistently. So that's a, that's a key piece that um, in many instances in many districts is a big barrier. So, um, so that, that's a positive excitement piece there. And then, um, and I do look forward to someday having a meeting where I don't say anything about metrics or anything like that. Um, so I will be brief here, um, let me make sure. Okay, so can you see the screen? Yeah, I got it. So, um, is that, and I shared briefly an email, but just actually just this afternoon, literally a couple of hours ago, um, ODE released uh, an update on the metrics that um, in an email, and what they said is we will have a bigger update with the metrics within 10 days and it will be included in that but they wanted to let districts know that this specific change was coming so that we could plan for it. Um, and the specific change is um, essentially we'll be able to access the K-3 exception that we operated um, back in the fall. So in September and October, we never hit the metrics to allow the kids to come on site for hybrid, but there was a K-3 exception that allowed us to have K-3 for most of fall. Um, so that essentially gets I don't know if the correct term would be reinstated or extended, um, but they said we can access that again as long as it meets certain criteria um, after the holidays. And so, and that would be our plan is um, then after the holidays, January 4th, um, that even if you are in red, you'd be able to have K3 on site. Um, and so uh, that's what we would want to move towards. And I just want to touch real quick on the conditions for it. Um, and the, the two top ones are key. So, um, and we actually, I had a, we had a quick meeting with the regional superintendents just to clarify understanding of that. And so the first bullet, if you can see I'm near the bottom of the page. Um, so in order to access the K-3 exception, we can't have, um, uh, it's, it's unrelated individual cases, uh, two or more separate cohorts, but the key term there is without a known source of exposure. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, how we interpret it and working with Sheree, our county health officer, is um, any cases that I'm familiar with that are connected with, with the school, we know the source of exposure. Um, a common one is a workplace, you know, some of our big workplaces in the area and that sort of thing. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily a positive test. It's like if you have those and you're, we're not sure where they're from. And so that would be working with county health. Um, but I think so far, you know, any that I'm aware of that connect to us, the, the source of exposure is known. So hopefully that would not be a trigger. Um, and then the second uh, piece, which um, our, our group interpretation of it um, is, uh, and, and we talk about the word clusters um, and how, how this is currently interpreted. And obviously if ODE clarifies, I'll share that with you and staff right away, um, is that the clusters are interpreted as um, transmission within school. Uh, so it's not just two cases of two kids. It would be if one kid gave it to another and that happened twice, uh, within a two week period, then you would have to go, you, you would no longer be able to access the K-3 exception and you would need to be back in CDL for K-3. So that's just particular to the K-3 exception right now that would allow us, um, even if we continued to be in red, to have K-3 back on site. And um, I think there's a pretty strong consensus is, you know, those are the kids that need it the most, all the kids need it. Um, but the younger they are, the less they benefit from even really good um, uh, distance learning. So, um, so that's that's an exciting development, and uh, and I think that we intend to access that, um, and we'll be communicating that with families as well. Um, so then, for the rest of the kids, uh, it is um, I, I tried to simplify this document, and really where we are right since we we did hit red this Monday. Um, next week's metrics really aren't going to impact one way or the other. Um, so we're essentially not going to worry about them. Um, so on Monday, the 28th, the following week, we'll determine our options for January 4th uh, there. So if, if we continue to be in red, or even if we drop down from red, but go back up, uh, if, uh, if the release of the 28th metrics, we are in red, um, basically we'll have to continue CDL for grades four through 12 we would be able to add um, K3 in person under the exception. And we would also be able to continue even in red with the limited in person. And that has its own set of requirements at smaller cohorts, uh, fewer kids, um, but we can actually, um, I, I think offer some you know, significant opportunities with that and we will continue to look on expanding that. Uh, so if we're in orange, it is pretty much the same picture. Um, that we can't have any other grades on site, but we still would be able to uh, do the K-3 exemption and we still would be able to do limited in person. So for us, um, the, the big change uh, zone would be yellow. Um, and if on the 28th we're yellow, that would enable us to essentially pick up where we left off um, with grades K-6 and 9 uh, could resume that week of January 4th. Um, in, in, with our hybrid in-person where we left off. And then if, if there are no, um, and I assume like, you know, triggering incidents like we see with the K-3 exception, so there's no communication within schools, you don't have a high amount of cases within schools, then after two weeks, if we're in yellow at that time, we would be able to add additional grades. Um, so I, I don't, based on ODE's email today, I wouldn't anticipate other significant changes to the, the metrics guides in the near future, other than the, the K3 exe exemption, exception uh, implementation. Um, but there's obviously some you know, initial conversations about now that uh, there is the potential for vaccine and education staff are fairly high on the list, but Oregon really hasn't yet specified where and when and that sort of thing. Um, so I know, and the governor has stated directly uh, in terms of the goal of having more kids on site um, in February uh, and, and potentially changing, you know, the metrics around that time, as well as, you know, the hopeful potential rollout with the um, vaccine could have a real positive impact as well. So questions about uh, the metrics piece, and then I have just one other um screen share i don't think so 
seems straightforward. You need to wait for that, hopefully, good news on the 28th, right? That's the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll know pretty strongly one way or the other what our options are. Um, and, and as um, I've signaled, and certainly uh, the board has signaled that, um, you know, if, if the metrics permit us to, it is our intent to, to access that. Um, I, I will say, um, really, um, it, it, would, it continues to be a significant challenge just with staffing, just like, uh, uh, you know, Helena mentioned, um, that we, we have actually had significantly low staff absence rates. I mean, from, from uh, talking and looking at some previous data, it's, it's lower than it's been in a long time, um, in, in many, many years, uh, in terms of just the general absence rate. And so, and the staff are really, um, you know, everyday principals are the, the staff are working with them to say, how can I minimize the time that I'm gone for, you know, I know we have a challenge in this area that I'm learning is, just access to services. Sometimes you have to drive two or three hours, and that does take a whole work day. But um, really, our staff, as, as a collective group, um, have, have really worked hard to minimize those impacts. Um, and again, we have really good staff attendance rates, um, and, and that's certainly good because you know we, we have very limited subs. We have to get creative about subs. Um, and we, we have offered, we've paid for a number of sub licenses for our existing staff, classified staff who hold a bachelor's. Uh, so that has been already enacted plan B where if you have a bachelor's, um, we'll pay if you're willing to be uh, available as a sub. And then of course you get paid as a sub um, to do that. So, um, and, and we'll continue that and just really looking for, uh, you know, creative solutions so that, um, you know, that, that, lack of staff doesn't impact our ability to operate, um, but it, at times it's close. Uh, okay, so let me get here. Okay, so do you see what happens when we have a positive case in school? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna go over this in detail, um, but I what I do wanna share is that um, we have made and are in the process of making some changes um, particularly at the elementary school, um, when we built the schedule, uh, the elementary school staff, you know, was like, okay, let's let's do the best services that we can given the requirements and restrictions. And so, um, so they did that. They did an amazing job of building the schedule with all of the different uh, the, the requirements and needs on that. Um, but what we realized, obviously, after a couple of exposures, was that. Um, be, largely because of the service model when you know one student who received particular services had a positive test it impacted an outsized amount of staff and, and it was typically more than a dozen staff were quarantined because of contact with the student um, and so they're in the process of changing that to where um, for the most part now there's always going to be some variability and, and, and you know some students will still need some more intensive supports and services but in general, the goal is that um, if, if there is a, a, you know, a second grade class student test positive, that it's only that class, now it would need to be both AM and PM because the teacher would be quarantined as well, um, would need to do CDL for the period of quarantine. Um, and so not, you know, hope that the goal is to not impact the entire school um, and, and or, you know, have to, to shut down like multiple grades and that sort of thing. So um, we do the individual contact tracing, but we've made some adjustments so that um, that's, that's tightened a bit uh, just in terms of our operations and our procedures. So with, with secondary, as you can see on that, um, and it's mostly, uh, let me scroll down here so you can kind of see, because um, I know that's a question of, well, if an eighth grader gets it, why does it shut down the whole eighth grade class and have them go to CDL? And, and really, that was the smallest that we could get those cohorts of kids. Um, and, and it's largely because of licensure in the different classes where you have to be an endorsed math teacher to teach math at middle school and high school. In elementary school, it is still more self-contained. So an elementary teacher can teach reading, math, science all to that same group of kids that um, for the most part licensure prevents that at the secondary level and then when you get to the high school you really can't do it just because credits are issued and there's requirements from the state of who can issue a credit you know I, I have to be an endorsed math teacher or be a part of that process in order for that student to earn a math credit um, 
So, so that was why they were in, uh, able to or uh, make it down to a grade level, but really not get it smaller than that um, for, for a typical, if you had a typical eighth grader um, needing to quarantine because they had a positive test, it would mean that eighth grade class. Um, and because the teachers are involved, it would be both AM and PM. Um, would quarantine for the quarantine period and need to be in CDL and then could come back after that. Um, so that's why both middle school and high school, we see that um, happening there. And um, But we have done and, and reviewed just our internal processes like meetings and those sorts of things, making sure that, for example, um, because 10th grade is a cohort, the 10th grade teachers are generally, you know, okay to meet in person together if they chose to. Um, but probably not a good idea to like have the 10th grade teachers meet in person with the 11th grade teachers, because if one of them, then that would bring down multiple grades in terms of needing to shift to CDL. And so if it's cross staff cohort, um, we're looking at and, and having them do virtual meetings just like these, um, which are you know very common across the district anyway. So we're looking at those detail pieces um, to really limit the impact where obviously the likelihood is, and especially with the general numbers the way they are, that there will be more um, student and staff cases, but our goal is that um, it doesn't prevent us from operating. Uh, so uh, questions about uh, these scenarios or, or how this will be approached after the holidays? No, I don't think so, not for me. And, and so we're working, this, this is a draft still, um, and, and Nancy and I will be, will be sharing with the community and sending this information out, um, and particularly for the secondary folks. So just so that folks know what to expect and know that there is a plan and understand that. So in case they do get the call saying, your, your child might have been exposed and you need to do distance learning that um, hopefully just having some, uh, you know, advanced knowledge of the plan and the scenarios might reduce the anxiety a little bit in there. And that's part of the communication goal. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. If all the plans we have, we can, the best we can share them. I think that's a great idea. Yes. And be very transparent about that. So we're, we're working up some new communication for the website and we'll be sending out I'll call message, giving folks a heads up uh, on those things. And then lastly, let me see if I have it available. Um, there we go. So uh, I think folks have heard that um, OSAA uh, revised their schedules uh, and essentially um, pushed out seasons two through four, uh, a few weeks into February now. Um, so season one has been extended through January and uh, Gene has worked out a schedule so that um, uh, the different high school sports will continue to practice and, and do activities that are allowable under the guidelines uh, for the month of January. Obviously, you have to get creative with the, with the weather. Um, and then the, the big change there, though, the other big change is that um, athletics are now, uh, essentially, they fall under the county, uh, the risk uh, metrics, and not OSAA. Um, and, and, it, and it makes sense in a way in saying, okay, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a club football team or a high school football team or even adult flag football league, they're all doing the very similar activity. Um, and so they're under those same guidelines. And so for us, the biggest impact is um, if, if the county is in the, uh, what is it, the, is it extreme risk? The highest risk level, the red zone. If the county is in that, then indoor practices are prohibited. Um, if the county is just in high or below, we can continue with indoor practices following the you know, number of people limitations and masking and all that sort of thing. So, so that's a little bit of the question mark. Um, but what, uh, what Jean also did as, as she worked with the coaches to um, for the practice schedule for January is the first week back is a bye week. So it's like, let's see where we are, let's see what we can do. And then the remainder of the weeks in January will be for, for the um, practicing and activities. Um, and then the intent there with the middle school is um, to essentially begin the middle school seasons at season two and run them through um, seasons as well. So our plan now is we, we will have the regular middle school seasons. They will just um, run kind of parallel to, um, uh, to, the, to the high school, at least the seasons, if not the sports. And then um, I know that there's some middle school athletic, 
athletic director conversations going on on uh, what opportunities to provide to the middle school kids. Okay, well, I hope some of that comes to fruition, both in the high school and the middle school, because you know, a lot of a lot of benefit, like we always talk about, but I think that's important to do where we can. Allow yeah, and I, and I will definitely, I will be um, meeting with uh, the middle school leadership and staff in terms of, okay, if, if um, you know, if they're not able to do a season, uh, we're going to encourage the coaches to come up with, you know, okay, here's what we can do. Um, and that was, you know, that's the same uh, in terms of the language with uh, the high school coaches as well, that if, you know, it, it keeps getting tinkered with what can we do and our intent would be if there's opportunities that we can provide the students, we want to do that. Um, even if worst case, it's just locally and kind of looks a bit like practice, um, we still want to offer those uh, opportunities for the kids to connect and connect to their sports teams and their coaches because for a lot of kids, that's a huge connection to school in general as well. So, Great, well, thank uh, you. Any questions about anything there? I just wanted to make sure that you're going to email us any of the um, things that are being shared that we don't have copies of in our packets. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I, some of them I emailed you earlier in the week, but I'll make sure you have uh, all that as well as the, um, the updated uh, OSAA seasons and that sort of stuff. I will send that out first thing in the morning. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Marshall. Appreciate that. Uh, next up, district reports. Any comments or questions from the board on what we had in our packet there? Or, or likewise, the finance or enrollment summaries? Okay. Well, appreciate, again, appreciate the, the including there. It's good to read for me. And I, I like to see they're kind of forming up a little bit of consistency on the, on the district reports there with some of those, some of the things we continue to talk about as far as goals and those things. So that's, that's nice to read, so thank you. Okay. Agenda item number seven, action items. I would look for a motion to appoint a budget committee member. Uh, Mr. Bruce Raleigh has an application here. I'll move to a approve uh, the appointment of Bruce Raleigh to the budget committee. I will second that motion. Thank you, Jay and Janice. Uh, any comments or discussion around this appointment? Other than thank you, Bruce, if you're uh, listening in, we appreciate you applying. <laughs> yes, no, I'm uh, glad to see his name come across personally, so. Yep. Um, Okay, let's go ahead and call for a vote on the motion here to approve this application. Catherine? Aye. Janice? Aye. Janelle? Aye. Jay? Aye. Aye for me as well. Congratulations, Bruce. Hope you're listening. Here, we'll look forward to working with you again. Okay, next up in the action items is the approval of a curriculum adoption. So if you're looking for a motion to approve the, I believe it's small engine repair curriculum that's in our packet. Um, I move to approve um, that um, curriculum adoption, the small engine repair. Excited to see something like that in our curriculum. Oops, I wasn't supposed to call. Yeah, me too. I Hold on, Janice. Let's let's look for a. We have a second out there yet? Oh, I'll give you a second. Okay, thank you, Janice. Now, if we have any questions or comments, <laughs> uh, the appropriate time to call for those. Uh, I really appreciate that it's there. I'm looking. I'm well. It was well well done, and um, I think it'll be a, a great help to a lot of our students. So, I agree. Yep, and again, just the reason that's in the the um, action items here is it's. Uh, required for the for these types of curriculum adoptions to come before the board. So we're following that requirement. And it's, um, yeah, I'll comment as well. I'm glad to see that uh, the new piece coming to us here. And I understand um, from Ms. Veritek through the superintendent that uh, we're all happy with the way that's shaping up and it should be a positive to a lot of students. So. Okay, let's call for a vote then, Catherine. 
Aye. Denise? Aye. Janelle? Aye. Jay? Aye. Aye for me as well. All right. We have a short-ish list of first reading on board policies. So I would um, look for a motion to approve these group of first readings here. I will make a motion to approve the first readings of the policies. I'll second that. Okay. Questions or comments on this uh, motion on the group of policies? All right. Well, let's go ahead and call for vote then, Catherine. Aye. Janice. Aye. Janelle. Aye. Jay. Aye. Okay. Aye for me as well. Okay, item D, acceptance of a donation from the Gibney Atkins Foundation. And um, looking for a motion for the acceptance of this donation. I'll move um, to I'll accept move. the Gibney. Okay, I'll Gibney. second it. Motion by Jay and a second by Catherine, thank you. Um, questions or comments on this? We have it in our packet as well. Um, thank you. I, I, I don't even think thank you is a strong enough word. And, and the things that they came up with, I think, are well-rounded and will absolutely make a difference. I was quite emotional when I saw that. So just really, really appreciate it. Yes, I agree. Um, now for, for the foundation and uh, Rory Smith out there, if, if you're going to hear this, I appreciate the continued support. And I think it's a great list of additions there that I think Sounds like the staff and um, the administration at K-School came up with. So that looks wonderful. Thank you. I was actually friends with Jane Gibney and I know she would be very happy to see the money spent this way. Really? That's neat. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and look for a vote then. Catherine. Aye. Janice. Aye. Janelle. Aye. Okay. Aye. Aye for me as well. Thank you. All right. Board functions and comments. Um, just so I, I think it's important that we continue to review our uh, board and district goals every month. So hope we kind of looked at those, everybody, on your, on your reading through the packet here. Do you have any questions or insights on, on those as we look at them this time? No, I, I did want to comment that I really appreciate the, it's clear in reading the board packets that we're seeing um, very intentional um, and creative ways of meeting those goals, you know, from the district standpoint and then, you know, working, you know, so I just, I just really appreciate seeing, I, seeing that this year, given everything that's going on with them, so. Yes, I really much, very much appreciate it, especially the district reports and, and you know, even Helena and Carol talking today in that framework around our goals. So that's um, kind of a, a consistent way to, to look at things. So I appreciate that. And I like the way um, Helen and Carol uh, used those goals in their report. Yep, I agree. Good, good. Okay, we'll keep, continue to keep them on your mind and then we'll keep talking about them as, as you know things come up and change and evolve. We will have them in front of us. Alan? Yes. Sorry. Um, I know you were talking about goal, goal uh, the board, sorry, not council, but board um, policies and goals. Um, were you looking at bigger picture or just the ones that we already have in place or, or are we doing other board comments after? Uh, well, specifically around the, the board and district okay. goals, um, it's my intention to just have them in the board packet and have an opportunity to talk about them every month. And if there's something that, you know, we feel we might need to address, that's it's maybe a time to start talking about it, but not specifically anything to necessarily change on them right now. Okay. Other than so I have a you. comment that I don't know if it's related to a future board. I feel like it should be part of policy and I'm... Um, 
I'm not sure if it's um, if we're ready to talk about it tonight, but I'd at least like to bring it up so that we can schedule it on a meeting. Um, okay. I was significantly disappointed that we closed for the last two weeks. Um, I thought we had pretty clear direction on a prior board meeting virtually, although I realized there wasn't a vote. Excuse my phone. And But um, I believe that that is a huge decision and that it should be a board policy if we're gonna restrict our school farther than the state. And I would at least like to have a board discussion and about that kind of topic. I mean, I, it's not small, it's not like we closed because we had a bomb threat or <laughs> this is like two weeks it's it's huge and I, I can't tell you I've heard so many disappointed parents and students and I'm I'm just really concerned that I don't want to have that happen again um no I appreciate your comments Regina. No, thank you um yeah maybe that perhaps would warrant a separate you know work session or something to kind of talk about how how those things can be handled differently in the future uh, what do you guys think about something like that I I think it's I think it's absolutely prudent. I mean, we're in a situation that we've never been in before, but a, even a policy that states that the school is not allowed to restrict uh, greater than the state in regards to closures without board approval. Um, because uh, this, um, I, I agree with what Janelle just said, uh, for us to choose to uh, take a stricter restriction, a uh, higher restriction than the state, um, is uh, was a rough go. And if we're talking about board policies and we're talking about our board goals and we're talking about student success, uh, we're talking about building relationships, <laughs> we're talking about all those things uh, does not fall in line at whatsoever with uh, choosing to close down the school and not uh, having to. Um, and that's two definitely different um, avenues. So I would love to discuss that as a as a potential um, agenda item uh, to discuss in the next in the future, and and, and and you know it's it's that's a lot for a superintendent to have to uh, navigate on his own um, to make a decision like that. I think that there should be the opportunity for a board consideration, public comment, uh, public weigh in um, when a decision like that is going to be coming in front of us. Um, so. Okay. Well, sounds like a desire to at least dig into this at some point uh, further. Um, I don't probably need to have a, a, a the appropriate type of meeting. Um, yeah, this, yeah, we need it would be appropriate for us. To, I, I think it would be appropriate for us to um, have a work session rather than to discuss it right now. And it, and it sounds like it's a matter of urgency. <clears throat> so looking at a work session sooner than later. Yeah. Okay. Well, how about if you guys are okay with it, maybe I'll work with um, Mr. Marshall and try to get something calendar calendared sooner than later here for our next regular session okay okay well we'll look forward to some communication on that we'll be talking about a little bit more so thank you for that thank you uh speaking of dates and things to, to think about um we have listed on here a board fiscal work session in january and maybe Didi or mr marshall can weigh in do we have a specific date? Or is that around the budget process we need to worry about? I, I, Dee Dee might have some more details. It was just more to get that on our radar in that uh, we wanted to start that conversation and process in January. Right. Um, okay. Just walking through it. So I, I don't, it, it wasn't any specific target or anything like that. But okay. Didn't um, know if we needed to come up with a calendar date on that sooner. No, and maybe what we can do is if we're looking at the calendar date for a workstation, also throw out dates for that as well. Um, and we're okay. going to look at those for uh, in January. Okay, uh, let's let's do that. If, if everyone doesn't mind, or, um, you know, I'll, I'll maybe have uh, David and Didi suggest a few for, for both those things, a work session and then a, a fiscal work session. I'm not sure if they could be combined or not, or maybe we need to look at two different times and maybe put a little thought into maybe how that might best work. Um, we can communicate that out and see what, what we can put on the calendar. Okay, David, we'll talk, we can talk tomorrow and get some dates to the board. Okay, thank you. Okay, the, the, the one date we do have on the calendar is uh, January 20th for our next regular board meeting. So we'll be sure we have that down for everybody. Then other than that, that is the last item I have. So any, any other last 
parting comments from the board. Do we have an executive session after this? No. Not tonight, no. No, good. <laughs> I just saw on the, on the email I got that it was from 5.30 to 8. I'm going, oh, wow, that's a long one. <laughs> I think we just uh, allow ourselves a little extra there in case we need. Okay, well, let's uh, go ahead and adjourn our meeting and. Thank you, everyone. Back. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.